fountains deep. <laughs> well, we're so glad you came this morning. We're continuing on in our series. Uh, we, how many of you were here Friday night? Was that fun? That was great, wasn't it? We're going to get to do that again. But, of course, we had folks here who weren't from our congregation, and I had a young lady approach me, and she said, uh, you're the pastor here, aren't you? I said, yes, ma'am. She goes, did you know that there are not 29 chapters in the book of Acts? <laughs> I went, oh, you're kidding me. <laughs> and I just smiled. I said, yeah, because you're chapter 29. She just grinned from ear to ear. And so that's the whole purpose of this series uh, that we started, gosh, a year ago. And believe it or not, we're going to finish chapter 17 today. So that, that'll be awesome, all right? The title of our message, it's going to be part two from last week, uh, Living Upright in an Upside Down World. And we're going to be Acts 17, verses 16 through 34. Last week, and you'll see the map. You have a map in your insert. You can just flip it over. You'll see it there. You'll see where we were last week as we went from Philippi to Thessalonica and then to Berea. This is the place, this is how we got the title of the message, where they accuse them of turning the world upside down. But we know in reality, that's not at all what was happening, but they were turning the world right side up. And so uh, we spent last week talking about what that looks like and, and how we, we are living in an upside down world. And that sh should not be a surprise to you. What should concern you is when we look at the upside down world and we think it's right side up. So we need to be careful that when, as believers, if we, God has placed us in this upside down world condition, we are called to, to stand right side up. And we saw three right side up principles last week. The first one, to keep from getting spiritual vertical in this time. You know, you ever had vertical where you're, you don't know what's up, down? If you've ever had that, it's a horrible experience. Pilots experience it as well. It's when you lose that point of reference and so our point of reference, we found if we're going to stand upright in an upside down world, the most important reference we have is what do the scriptures say? And that becomes our rule of faith and practice. And that's being set aside in a lot of places today, and which is creating this scenario. If we're going to stand upright, we're going to all, that question is always going to be before us. What does the scripture say? Secondly, as we watch Paul and Silas and how they were mistreated, we found that resistance is not failure. Resistance is just because you're having resistance. It feels like failure, but it's not. Oftentimes, it's the fertilizer for your garden. Things are going to come out of it that are going to be incredible. And lastly, Paul and Silas taught us in that situation that we are to always keep the main thing the main thing. What is the main thing? Why did Jesus come? So you could have a new car, better house, better way of life. Hey, a better version of me, maybe. No, he came as the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. He came as our Savior, the sacrificial lamb. And that was his mission, and it's our mission too. And that's what the book of Acts is all about. When Jesus said the Holy Spirit's going to come for one purpose, that we would be witnesses. To do what? To take the gospel to the uttermost parts of the earth. And so we're seeing that. This is Paul's second missionary journey, and we're following him. And today, we're going to take that next step. We left last week. Uh, uh, Paul's having to do what he's... It's kind of become his M.O. He's going to have to leave town in the dark, right? He's getting kicked out of town again. And so this time, I don't know if he's planning it or not, but he's going to be going to Athens. And so uh, you'll just circle that. You'll see where he's going down there. That's actually 300 miles. It takes three days by ship in that day. If you would go by land, it would be two weeks. So it was quite a journey. And as he left in the night, some folks took him. It seems to indicate someone who knew where they were going, new people. We're going to take him, get you settled in in Athens. And then Paul told them, send word to Timothy and Silas to come and join me as soon as possible. And so that's where we left it last week. As we pick up our story, we're going to find Paul getting off the ship, walking into Athens. And here's what he's going to see, a picture here, both of what it might have looked like then and what it looks like today. The the Parthenon is the temple in, in the middle of the Acropolis. And that, that's the temple to honor the goddess Athena. See, and if you look real close, you'll see her statue. It was so large, it poked up over the buildings. And so when Paul got off his ship, he would have seen this. And of course, if you go to Greece today, I haven't had the opportunity to go, I'd like to. Uh, of course, we see the temple part of it, its, its ruins still stand. 
It reminds us of this great city. It's one of the oldest cities in the world, actually. Been around for centuries. At this point in time, they were on the decline. Their glory days were actually a uh, hundred years before, a couple hundred years before, but it was still the intellectual center of the known world. Uh, we, names like you will recognize, uh, Plato or Aristotle. Do those names remind you if you've done Greek study in your schoolwork? We know that these were the great minds of the day, and Aristotle was actually the tutor, tutor of Alexander the Great. And Aristotle and his teachings actually most affect the Western world and our culture. We've taken on some of that. In the next picture, you're going to see, because I want you to realize these are real places that we're going to read about today. This is actually what we call, the Romans called it Mars Hill, and the Greeks called it uh, Areopagus. It was the Areopagus. And if you go there, it's still there. It wasn't, so much, it wasn't as much a place as it was a gathering of, of minds. And there's a plaque, a bronze plaque in that picture. If you go there, you'll see it. It's actually Paul's sermon written in Greek on the wall. If you know how to read Greek, you'll be able to see it still there today. And you can see from Mars Hill looking back, then you see the temple. These are all the things that Paul saw. This is actually where he was. So we're going to pick up our text today. And what we're going to look for is three upright lessons, three upright lessons from the marketplace. Now, last week we were in the temple, and we'll be a little bit in the temple just briefly, but it's going to overflow now out of the temple, and it's going to go into a marketplace, into the public square. And let's follow Paul and see what lessons we can learn, because he is definitely going into an upside-down situation. He's walking right into paganism, a place you wouldn't necessarily expect a believer to go, Paul's going to find himself right in the middle of it, all right? Let's pick up the story. I'm going to put it on the screen for you so you can follow along with us, all right? While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace, day by day, with those who happen to be there. Now, I don't know what you see in that scripture, just looking at it, just a little, some little pebbles there that will feed into what we're going to be talking about today. But I want you to notice, I love the phrase, while he was waiting. While he was waiting. How many of you like to wait? Yeah. I call it the waiting room of life. We spend a lot of time waiting, don't we? Where you're, he's waiting for, uh, of course, Timothy and Silas to come and join him. He doesn't know how long it's going to take them. Are they going to come by land? Are they going to come by sea? He's not really sure. He just sent word. But he's got to kill some time while he's there. I want you to know something that oftentimes it's the waiting time that can become ministry time. Sometimes we see waiting time as wasted time. Don't waste it. When you're in a season of waiting, you need to just kind of in prayer say, well, God, what is it? you're going to want to do during this time of waiting. Notice he was distressed by what he saw. He was troubled in his heart. As he walked into the city, he saw all the idols. How many idols were there? Thousands. In fact, some people used to say there were more idols than people in Athens, all right? Uh, that's an exaggeration, but there were a lot of them. And when you walked up the road to, to Athens, all along the way, there was an idol for every god they could think of. And they took great pride in in celebrating all the God's small g of the known world, and they made sure they were all represented there. And when Paul saw that, it grieved him a little bit. Well, then the third thing I see in that scripture, and we saw it last week, it says that he reasoned in the synagogue. But notice, he says, and he also did it in the marketplace. Do you remember what the word reason means? The root word? Dialogue. Dialogue. He's teaching us something very important. I know I've been thinking about it all week, that it's important that we learn how to dialogue with people. Uh, he shared the gospel. Someone texted me last week. If it only takes a couple minutes to share the gospel, why did it take Paul three weeks to share the gospel? Well, it was because he, that was at the end of it. He was dialoguing. You don't just move in, right? He was dialoguing. He was establishing rapport with people and engaging them where they were. This is actually really church outside the wall, right? Paul was uh, feeling the upside down culture around him. And, it, it, and you should too. You should too. When you're watching the news and all the stuff that's going on around us, it's so upside down, isn't it? And I, I believe that God wants your heart to be moved by it. But here's our first upside down truth that you must remember in these situations. 
God's going to give you a burden. He's going to burden your heart for other people. He's going to break your heart for what you see around you. Listen, this is very important, especially as we're entering a political season. It's not about being mad. It's about being sad. And so oftentimes we get angry and upset by what we see when really it should break our hearts. We we should be overwhelmed by it all. In fact, the word tells us that uh, we should be slow to speak and quick to listen for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. And I just want to caution you now, sometimes our personalities are such, some of us are a little more aggressive than others, right? And some of us are very, some of us are very loud and we're very demonstrative in it. Yeah. But just remember, when you see these things that are so upside down around you, don't be mad, be sad. Let God burden your heart. He wants to give, have you ever had a burden for someone it just came upon you. Have you ever been maybe at the grocery store and God just drew you to somebody and you just felt something? Are you overheard a conversation and maybe it even saddened your heart? Or maybe you see somebody who's, who's sad and you, you just feel something for them and you feel like you should go up and talk with them. I believe God burdens our hearts and I think that's what Paul well, he didn't. He wasn't looking for it. He didn't ask for it. He just showed up. It's a. It's a waiting time. They're just. He wasn't planning on staying in Athens. Where was he going? Where's he going next? Corinth. That's his real destination. But he's got to pass through Athens on the way. And here he is. He's waiting. And yet, I believe wherever your feet are. That's where your ministry is, and you need to be sensitive. And if you're sitting in a waiting room, don't just get all in your little bubble. Maybe God's, and God could touch your heart. Let's look at these scriptures here. I think they'll be helpful to you. In Romans 9, Paul says something that, I don't know, I don't think I could say this. But it illustrates the great burden he had. He said this, With Christ as my witness, I speak with utter truthfulness. My conscience and the Holy Spirit confirm it. My heart is filled with sorrow and grief. For my people, my Jewish brothers and sisters. Okay, that's good. He's got a burden, right? Listen to this. I would be willing to be forever cursed and cut off from Christ if it would save them. Who's going to get in that line? I can tell you right now, not me. I, I, I look at that and I go, Lord, how can you even say that? What kind of burden would that be where you would be willing to lay aside your own, what God, and for the sake of someone else. How many of you have ever heard of the, uh, I, think I, I think I'm pronouncing it right, the Moravian, the Moravian missionaries. Have you heard them from the 1700s? I got this incredible story I want to read to you about these missionaries. It says the Moravians had learned that the secret of loving the souls of men was found in loving the Savior of men. Let that soak in a little bit. On October 8, 1732, a Dutch ship left the Copenhagen Harbor bound for the Danish West Indies. On board were two Moravian missionaries, John Dober and David Nitschman. Both boarded the ship and their hearts were to minister and bring the gospel to slaves. They were told that they could not go. But God had given them a burden. And they said, we're we're not going to let you board the ship. It's too dangerous. Uh, No, you can't do it. And so they went to prayer. In fact, this group had a 100-year prayer meeting. It went on for 100 years, this group. They were people of prayer. And in one of those prayer times, they came out of the prayer, and both of them said, I know what we'll do. We'll sell ourselves as slaves. They went to a slave merchant and sold themselves to them so he would have to take them to the West Indies. Who would do that? They had to say bye to their families on the dock because everybody told them, you're not coming back. You're not coming. Well, they did, but their heart was like, Paul, I'm going to sell my, I'm going to give up all my freedoms. And so what, what is this? Proverbs 1130 says the fruit of 
the righteous is a tree of life, and the one who is wise saves lives. Matthew 4, 19, Jesus was on the beach. He called his disciples. What did he say they would do? They were all fishermen. He said, listen, guys, I'm going to make you fishers of men. That is the heart of God. That is our mission. That is our calling. That's what Paul said in, in Acts 20. We looked at last week. It's his life first. That my life only serves one purpose, and that is to fulfill the mission of declaring the gospel to others that they might be saved. Well, nothing, listen, nothing will keep you more from spiritual vertical than sharing your faith with other people. Nothing will keep you right side up more than sharing the gospel with other people. You say, well, that's for, that's for professionals. Or I don't have the gift of evangelism. Well, I, I, I realize there are people that got it. I think Sam has that. <laughs> you know, I don't necessarily think I have that, but I do have a mandate and I do have a burden to share the gospel with the lost. It is the reason I draw breath. And so if you're experiencing spiritual vertical and you're confused by everything that's happening in the world and everything's spinning around and you're yelling at your TV set and you're just uptight about everything, I'll tell you what the answer is. Turn off your TV and go share Jesus with somebody. It'll help balance you and bring you back to center. Let's keep reading our story. Can we pick it up at verse 18? A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with Paul. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Well, who are these two groups of philosophers? Well, Paul knew exactly who they were, and it will affect the things he's about to say because God has caused their paths across in the marketplace, and they're not going to take him to Mars Hill where he is going to enter into dialogue. But it's important we understand who are these two groups. You will identify with them because they still exist today, but we don't call them this. Here on the screen, you'll see it, the Epicureans. They believe that pleasure and happiness is the goal of life, the, that you are to avoid pain at all costs, and that the gods were uninvolved in the daily human affairs of man. Well, what about the Stoics? A little different. Stoics were pantheists. They believed in many gods. They were proud. Dignity, a life without dignity was unacceptable to them. They believed that reason, not passion, should govern your life, and that gods are everywhere in everything. That's just a brief summary of these two positions. Paul understood those positions well. He knew he was talking to. In fact, as you listen to the words that he spoke, he's actually addressing these philosophies. And they still exist today, just in different forms, and we've relabeled them, but they're still present with us. Let's look at verse 19. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said, where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. <laughs> Boy, Sam, I think of that scripture, always learning but never coming to the truth, right? That's what they're always learning, always. And so this was something they did every day. And this place has great history. I don't know if Paul knew it or not, but uh, Socrates, actually, in the year 399 B.C., he was sentenced to death on this very place for speaking to this, this gathering of people in his day, and they sentenced him to death. I don't know if Paul knew that, but he might be on, on some dangerous ground, but I think he's kind of up to it, don't you? After all he's been through, I don't think it's a big thing to him. He just took the opportunity because the door opened. Let's keep reading verse 22. Let's see what he had to say. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the, of the, Areop of the Areopagus, and he said this, people of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. What's he saying? I know who he is. I know who he is. Now I want you to notice here this phrase, because it's so relevant today. They were very religious. Is our country very religious? 
It is. Just because somebody's religious doesn't mean they're redeemed. We can be very, in fact, the word we would probably use today, what's most people, I'm spiritual. Yeah. What's your spiritual life like, right? It, it would, they would fit into this category. Well, here they were, they were very religious, but yet there's this altar among all the other gods that are there. There were thousands of them. Paul finds this one. Now, I don't know if he knew about it, but tradition says, Greek tradition says, the, the way that, the reason it was there was because there was a time in, in Athens history where a, a great pandemic came across the land and people were dying. And so they had the attitude that you have to feed the gods, you have to bring them gifts to appease them, and, and of course then they'll bless you, right? And so uh, th they had this, according to their tradition, there was this incredible sickness that came over the land and nothing seemed to work. And so they realized there must be a God we've missed. There's, we don't know who he is. And one of the Greek philosophers said, well, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna get a bunch of sheep and we're gonna release them on Mars Hill, but first we're gonna, we're gonna kind of starve them for a while, make sure they're really hungry. And then in the morning, the morning dew, we're gonna release them on Mars Hill and, and they're, they're gonna start grazing. And if you know anything about sheep, if they're hungry, they will not lie down. He said, any sheep that lie down, that will mark the place of the altar for whoever this God is. And so supposedly that's how this particular altar came to be among all the thousands. Here's a God, we don't know his name. And I love it because Paul entered into a pagan scenario, didn't he? That most people would have never went to. It would, it would have never happened. And he goes there, it's an open door for him. Listen, let's keep reading in verse 24. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Who's he talking to? He knows, he knows their philosophy. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man, he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. He's, he's dealing with racism. He's hitting them right where their culture lies. He understands it. He knows his audience. He's addressing these groups. Keep reading verse 26. He's, and he says, and, and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. Listen, God did this so they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as some of our own poets have, some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. What do you think about that? Paul starts quoting some of their poets. He understood their culture, their language. He understood who his audience was. This is the first sample of cross-cultural ministry, and Paul models it well for us. Where was Paul raised? And Tar Taurus, that's right. Taurus was a Greek province of, uh, of the day, and he, he sat under, who, do you remember the rabbi he sat under? Gamaliel, right? And Gamaliel was real big into Greek poetry and philosophy, and he sat under that. He learned Greek language and literature and governance, so he was well-versed in this, and he, he knew his audience very well. And, and I want you to see something here, what Paul says. This is amazing to me. He, he says, God wants them to seek him and reach out to him and find him. And, and though he is not far from us. What is Paul saying here? He's, he's saying, and you need to know this when you're talking to me, in every person, God has put a desire in them to find him. I have a book that I introduced in first service. If you get, now there's a new edition. Dr. Dave already sent it to me on a text, so this is an old edition. It's called Eternity in Their Hearts by Ron Richardson. This used to be required reading for YWAM students as they went prepared for home and foreign missions. Now, I encourage you to read it. It starts with Paul on Mars Hill and then takes you through some incredible stories. It might rock your world a little bit as far as, uh, some, you know, we get pretty narrow in some of our views, but uh, what God might do and how God might manifest himself to people might be outside of your comfort zone, but he's always has a witness in the world. And Paul seems to be suggesting that, that listen, so, you guys have all these idols, you know why? You're looking for something, but you're looking at all the wrong places. Instead of just saying, I'm not gonna go to Mars Hill, that, that's a pagan place, no way am I going there. 
Here's our, here's our second upright truth. Engage people where they are. Engage people where they are. Sometimes we stay away from places like this because we think it's compromise. You can have compassion without compromise. You can go into places that you wouldn't ordinarily go and, and, and not compromise anything that you believe. We were talking earlier, uh, Gordon Blyseth, a good friend of mine from Valley Center, some of you know him. He told me a story once of a, a man who drove by a particular tavern every day. And one day, just like our sermon here today, he had a burden. He saw people coming out of the bar, and they were drunk. And he saw in the news where there had been some conflict at the bar. Instead of being mad, he said, I was really sad. And he said, I couldn't drive by the bar without feeling this. And, and my heart just broke for these people. And so he went into the bar one day, and he went up to the bartender. He, and he said, sir, I would like to be the chaplain of your bar. And the bartender said, you get out of here right now or I'm calling the cops. Oh, no, I don't mean you any harm. I, I just want to be the chaplain. I care about these people. No, you get out of here right now or I'm calling the police. So he left. Couldn't get rid of the burden. You ever had a burden like that? Can't shake it. Just stays with you. So he went back in. He said, sir, I'm sorry, but I, I think about this at night. I, I just want to be the chaplain of your bar. He said, no, you're going to disrupt it. You're going to, well, I got enough conflict now. I don't need you here. He said, please, just give me a chance. He said, ah, here's what I'll do. You set me a little table over here in the corner, and we'll put a little sign on the table that says chaplain, and I'll order a Coke every time I come in so you'll make some money off me, and I won't talk to anybody. They'll have to come and talk to me. He said, well, okay, but if, if you... If, if you step out of these boundaries, you're out of here. He goes, no problem, I won't. So he was so excited the first Friday to go to the bar, set up his little table. He put his little chaplain sign on there, put a couple chairs and his chair, and nobody talked to him. So he left, still had the burden, came back again. No one talked to him, second week. You, you ever had an experience like this? You're following your burden, but... You don't see anything from it. And so he goes to the third week. And on the third week, it was almost time for the bar to close. And this guy came up, and he was pretty snookered, you know, and as drunk as he could be. And he goes, what are you doing here? He said, well, I came here to meet you because I knew you wouldn't come and meet me. And the guy goes, whatever. And he sits down, and he starts to pour out his life pretty soon. After weeks, more and more people are sitting down at the chaplain's table because they realize he loved them and cared about them. He wasn't mad at them. He was broken for their situation. He stayed a whole year at this bar before he moved away. And when he left, they threw him a party. I mean, who does this kind of thing? You'd have to really love people. In 1 Corinthians 9, we looked at this a couple of weeks ago. It's so important. This is Paul's attitude. Is it yours? Even though I am a free man with no master, I have become a slave to all people to bring many to Christ. Is that what happened to the two missionaries? Is it, would you be willing? When I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew to bring the Jews to Christ. When I was with those who follow the Jewish law, I too lived under the law. Even though I am not subject to the law, I did so. I did so. I, so I could bring those who are under the law to Christ. When I am with the Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law, I too live apart from the law, so I can bring them to Christ. But I do not ignore the law of God. I obey the law of Christ. Compassion without compromise, see? When I am with those who are weak, I share their weakness, for I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I try to find common ground with everyone. There it is. Doing everything I can to save some. Is that your heart? You see, he sounds like a salamander. In fact, that's the kind of thing I tell my kids not to do. Don't blend in over here and blend in over here. You're just becoming like your surroundings. That's not, what he's, that's not what he's doing. That would be the upside down approach. But right side up is I'm going to connect with people where they are. So oftentimes we want people to be like us. And we, we meet somebody and we think they ought to be just like us. And I always say, what do you expect sinners to act like? What do you expect lost people to do? They're living, what, they're living in an upside-down world. Don't be mad about that. 
may it be a burden to you. May it cause you to be sad and your heart full of compassion so you can enter in and connect with them wherever they are. In Matthew 9, Jesus calls Matthew to be his disciple. Who's Matthew? Oh, he's the most loved occupation of the day. He's a tax collector. Everybody loved tax collectors, right? <sighs> no, not a tax collector. And he calls him to be his disciple. And so what does Matthew naturally do? He's going to have a dinner at his house. Who's he invite? Well, it's recorded for us. Later, Matthew invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other disreputed sinners. I like that. <laughs> but when the Pharisees saw this, they asked the disciples, why does your teacher eat with sinners? And when Jesus heard this, he turned and he said, Healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. Then he added, now go and learn the meaning of the scripture. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. For I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. You don't have to tell people they're sinners. They already know it. But what he's saying is we need to connect with them where they are. I think sometimes we think we got to clean up the fish first. You got to get cleaned up to come to God. That's ludicrous. No. That's why we re that's why salvation is what it is. You come as you are and then God does a work in us. He receives us. I, I want to give you a, an image of something up right now. Just happened last week. I was meeting with Philip Wood, the former pastor of this church, and he informed me that there was a pastor from Hutchison, a Wesleyan pastor, who's, who has a burden. He has a burden, and, and, and he, he makes the best barbecue around, okay? And he decided he was going to start a ministry called The Big Table. And he's going to go around to strategic places where God leads him and have a barbecue, a free dinner for people. And so Philip, you know, lives across from the park there, right? And so he got the little house over there at the park, and just on August 14th, they had a little gathering. Look what it says. This is the invitation. It goes out to everybody around. Anybody can come. He's, and it says that this is the, the big table. You come, community dinner and a Jesus story. Community dinner and a Jesus story. So Philip said, I got to go and see what this is. So he goes and he says, man, it was the most wonderful barbecue he'd ever had. And then the pastor got up. Didn't say he was a pastor. He just got up and he read a parable of Jesus. He said it was only about 15 minutes. And then he prayed with everybody. And then just stood around, and they had dialogue the rest of the time. And, and Philip told me about this. I said, man, I want to know more about this. And he said, he was, I said, he said but he was very discouraged because there's not many people coming as he thought. I said, well, I'm coming next month. Anybody else want to go with me? I'm going to come next month because I want to encourage him in this because I think this is the kind of thing that's on Jesus' hearts. It's about table ministry. And that's where you meet people right where they are. And you don't have to, you, we think we got to have, uh, and no offering was taken. Hallelujah. <laughs> it was really free, actually free. And it wasn't even a box in the back, okay? <laughs> and what is, who, what is this? It's a burden God gave him to connect with people where they are. And I think Paul's demonstrating that for us right now. And you've got you to know your audience. You notice he doesn't speak to these people like he did the people in the synagogue. It's different. <clears throat> See, we've got a cookie sheet thing. It's just got to be the same time right around. People go, who are you? What, what are you up? Paul knew how to engage these people. Can, can, we, can we read on? Can we finish the chapter here? Verse 29. Therefore, since we're God's offspring, he said, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance. But now, he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. So you can have compassion without compromise. He's speaking the truth. He's not watering it down. Keep reading verse 32. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered. Others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus. What? Who is this? This is one of the philosophers came to believe. And, and, and then there was this woman, 
Damaris, and a number of others. Some people criticize Paul. As I read this week, I was a little surprised by some of the criticism Paul receives for doing what he did. They think he was wrong. They think he missed God. I don't, I can't, I don't think so. I think he knew exactly what he was doing. Now, this is different from all the other places because there's only a handful of people. In the other places, great multitudes came. This is our last upright point that you need to know if you're going to stand in an upside-down world. You've got to keep sowing no matter what the results. And you've got to stop looking at the numbers. Stop looking at the scoreboard. Remember the three parts, God's part, my part, other people's part. It's always present. I just need to focus on my part. Remember Paul said, we plant, we polish water, but God gives the effect. It's God. That's not my part. I just need to keep, I just keep the neat sowing. And it'd be easy to Paul say, well, this wasn't as good as the meeting last week. Last week it was so many more people, and that's not the point. And the poor pastor, that's what I want to tell him. I want to go to the big table and say, don't look at numbers, man. Who knows? Somebody may come here, one person. They may change their life, and that will change a lot of other people's lives. You can't, you can't know that. You can't discern that. Your part is just to plant and water. Colossians 1.18, the message of the cross, Paul said is foolish, or 1 Corinthians, I'm sorry, first chapter. He said the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are headed to destruction. But we who are being saved know it is the power of God. As the scripture says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and disregard the the intelligence of the intelligent. So where does this lead the philosophers, the scholars, the world's brilliant debaters? You think he was thinking back to Athens? I bet he was. God has made the wisdom of this world look foolish. Since God, in his wisdom, saw to it that the world would never know him through human wisdom. He has used our foolish preaching to save those who believe. It is foolish to the Jews who ask for signs in heaven. It is foolish for the Greeks who seek human wisdom. So when we preach the Christ is crucified, the Jews are offended and the Gentiles say it's all nonsense. But those who, that those, listen, but those called by God to salvation, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. The foolish plan of God is wiser than the wisest of human plans. And God's weakness is stronger than the greatest of human strength. You've got to know this. It's God who saves people. That's not my job. I plant. I water. Remember Lydia. God opened her heart. God opens people's hearts. Listen, we can't even take credit for our salvation. It's not by works. God draws us. I think in some way the sovereignty and free will of man somehow holds hands together. I don't quite understand it. It's a mystery. But here I know it's God's work in us. It's God who's doing it. And if I show up and I'm faithful and nothing happens, glory to God. I, I was obedient. Obey God. Leave the results to him. Obey God. Leave the consequences. Matthew 13, I won't read it, but you know it. It's the parable of the sower. You need to remember what that's about. As the sower goes out, Jesus was telling this story. He wanted to know this is what it's going to be like. You're going to, there's nothing wrong with the seed. There's power in the seed. But sometimes the responses are going to be varied. Seed will fall on hard ground. That's people who don't understand. The birds are going to come and snatch it away. People will stare at you like a deer in a headlight and won't even understand the thing you're saying. Just It's okay. It's okay. You're just sowing seeds. You don't know what's going to happen, all right? Did you see the three responses in the story? Some of them sneered at him. Some of them said, let's talk again. And some of them believed. That will be your experience, too. Some of the seed in the parable fell on hard ground. What was that? That was the seed that springs up quickly. And then trouble comes. And they dry up. Boy, I know a lot of people like that. Have you ever invested in somebody's life and you sowed the seed? And, and boy, it didn't take long. Trouble came and they just melted down. And then there's seed that falls in the thorny place. I think that represents us most in our culture, in the culture of materialism that we saw in Greece. It's the cares of the world. And it says they choked out the seed. I'll tell you, that's, that's, I see that in so many people's lives. There's nothing wrong with the seed. But, but so, now, I, I believe, I, I look at that scripture different than most people because I think I see that and I think, well, God's just telling me what I need to do. I need to go to the hard ground and hold up. I need to go to the, the rocky place and clear it out. 
I need to go to the thorny place and help people get rid of the thorns so we can have some good soil out of some of the bad soil. That's what I think. That's my mission. You know, I'm not going to let that, oh, well, too bad. What will be will be. No, let's get out our hole. We know why. We know what's happening. Let's respond to it, all right? And then, of course, the good soil, once you have that, 30, 60, 100 fold, that's a miraculous return. I believe we can expect that. Amen? So we're going to come to the table this morning. We're going to go back to Paul's words, 1 Corinthians. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. This is the power of God. This simple message, this simple message, we have received it. If you haven't, today's your day. I invite you to come to this table for the very first time as Andrew's playing. Just want you to just think about it. Is God, is God pulling on you? I'm not pulling on you. I can't say you. But if God is speaking to your heart today, and he's, you know what he's saying to you? Just what Paul is saying. He's saying, I'm closer than you think. And I've done these things in your life so that I could draw you to me. Won't you respond? You can come today and take that cup and bread for the very first time. And say, I believe what Jesus did is for me, and I want to receive that free gift today. And at the end of the service, if you do that, then I want you to come to me, and I want to talk to you, and we'll pray together, and we'll start walking together in the weeks ahead. Amen? It'll be a great journey. It'll be a great journey. But it all begins right here. It seems foolish to the world. And some people will laugh at you and say, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. There's got to be more to it than that. But then there'll be those who say, I believe. Was God doing it? I remember when I believed. Do you remember when you believed? I was in Major Froberg's living room and I knelt at this coffee table, cried my eyes out. This hard hearted kid. God melted my heart. Major Froberg didn't melt my heart, God melted my heart. He was there. And you will sow where you will not reap, and sometimes you'll reap where you have not sown. But keep sowing. Keep sowing no matter what. Amen? I'd like you to make that commitment today as we come to this table, would you? Father, I thank you. I thank you. I thank you because you saved me. I thank you because you brought people into my life to sow seeds. I thank you for the power of the seed and what it means in my life. And now, Lord, I want to spend my days sowing it into other people's lives. Would you help us today? Give us a burden us a burden, Lord, for others. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. And after the burden, would you help us engage wherever they are, wherever our feet are, that's where our ministry will be. And we commit this week to keep sowing no matter what. Let it be in our families, our friends, our neighbors, where we work, in our city, around the nation, to the ends of the earth. In Jesus' name, amen. We invite you to come down the center aisle this morning, make your way to the table, take the cup and bread, turn to your seat, and then we'll receive it together. God bless you as you come.